We all know Santa Claus, but how well do we know St. Nicholas? That's who Santa is, after all. A boy born back in 270 AD to rich parents Theophanes and Nona in Batera Lysia, Turkey. Due to the plague, both of his parents died when he was very young, so he was raised by his uncle John and obtained his parents' fortune. He was raised Christian, taught by his uncle Nicholas, who was the bishop of Batera. Later, his uncle would ordain him as a priest, and Nicholas would continue to lead a wholesome life. He is where our story begins. The Golden Legend, also known as The Lives of Saints, is a collection of primary sources that was compiled by Jacobus de Veragin in 1275. The stories record events of the faithful saint and many others, and one accord in particular documents a story called The Gift of Gold for Three Daughters, which is to thank for many of today's traditions and gets lots of credit for St. Nicholas's transformation into Santa. Nicholas's neighbors had three daughters, but the family had slipped into poverty after a pirate raiding of their ship. The father didn't have enough money for dowries to marry off his daughters, and thinking he would have to sell his children to a life of prostitution, Nicholas made an unexpected visit that night. Just around the same time, he was wondering what to do with his large fortune, and feared if he did not distribute it, it would hinder his growth in his faith. Nicholas left a wrapped lump of gold in the daughter's house, which was plenty of money for a dowry. When the father found it in the morning, he praised the Lord and married off his first daughter. The next night, Nicholas put another lump in the house, and again, the father was overjoyed to find enough money to marry off his second daughter. But this time, after thanking God, he was determined to find out who was gifting all the money. The cycle repeats the next night, except that Nicholas puts double the amount of gold in the house, and the father had stayed up. When he became alerted by the sound of gold, a man chase between the two continues until the dad recognizes who it is. The chase stopped, and Nicholas finally let him thank him for his gifts. Quickly disregarding the thanks, he reminded the man that good deeds should be done for the Lord, and he made the father promise to never tell anyone that he was the one who had gifted the gold. While he didn't want people to thank him for his good deeds, he was able to capture people's attention and lead them to a holier life. He was given his sainthood because of his selfless acts, and his main focus was on the Lord. So while others faltered to temptations to something like money, St. Nicholas rose above it. Because he could be trusted to do what was best for others, people would come to him in times of need to get help for themselves or to make him aware of others' plights. The gift of gold for three daughters could have been the earliest story of Saint Nick's good deeds, but it was passed down mostly through oral tellings, and several different versions ended up being written. All of them telling roughly the same things, but the exact details we can never be sure of. The earliest primary source of old Saint Nick that has survived is called Sterilitist and was written anonymously around 400 AD. Looters that were acting like soldiers coming off of boats in Andariki, which was the largest port closest to Myra, were arrested for looting, but when people heard, they started storming the real soldiers due to miscommunication. Nicholas heard of the commotion and rushed to the scene. He quickly assessed what was happening and straight up asked the soldier they were criminals. When they explained the situation, they were invited back to his church, but when they got there, some villagers approached Nick and told him there were three innocent people that were going to be beheaded. They felt safe going to him, even though the priests had ordered the executions and it was uncommon for people to speak against his orders, but they knew that he wouldn't passively stand for the unjust beheading of three innocent generals. He went to the plaza, named Leotoni, and made sure that they were still alive. The people reassured him and pointed them in the direction of Byra, where the beheading was going to take place. Arriving to the area, he saw the classic setup. There were bags over their heads and their chained hands behind their back, and the weird dude with the beheading sword. Nicholas went right up to the beheader, took the sword, threw it to the ground, and freed the three men. It was quoted that someone described him as the righteous or as bold as a lion. Then he brought the men with him as he ventured through the city to confront Estesis the Preces. Nick certainly let him know the error of his ways, and in return, Estesis pleaded for forgiveness and demanded it was Eutychus and Simonides, who were the head of the state. Nicholas knew better that it was not their fault, and Estesis would receive quite a bit of money for the executions. Even still, the army officers spoke in favor of Estesis, but everything was sorted out and the three men were let go. He felt called to a city named Myra, now Demre, Turkey, but after he came, the standing bishop had died and the search for a new bishop had begun. It was said that one of the bishops who was responsible for finding a replacement heard a voice telling him that Nicholas was to be the new archbishop. Nicholas gained the title of archbishop around 300, but soon afterwards he was arrested in Rome for being Christian in 303. He couldn't return back to his duties until 313 when the national religion was changed to Christianity. A little while later, in 325, he served as a councilman to the Council of Nicaea and boldly defended the orthodox views of Christianity against the leader Arius, who pushed for the religion of Arian. Like many other bishops, Nicholas was outraged with the religion teaching that Jesus was just a man and nothing more. He was not as holy as he said, and he was below God instead of part of the Holy Trinity. Being so enraged, St. Nicholas actually stood up and slapped Arius across the face. The council thought it would be best to remove his title and throw him off the council, but he greatly apologized and was allowed to stay. When St. Nicholas died on December the 6th, 343, he was originally buried in Myra. Over 700 years after he was buried, Italian merchants dug his body back up in 1087, carried him to Bascalia de St. Nicola Berry in Italy, and buried him again there. His tomb was filled with relics that were called, wait for it, the Berry Relics. After opening his tomb, the Berry Relics and his bones were first examined on May the 5th in 1953 by scientists Luigi Martino and Dr. Alfredo Ruggieri. Almost an inch of liquid was found in the bottom of the tomb, but upon further inspections, no cracks could be found in the walls. The tomb did need extensive repair in its floors, so the anatomical examination of his bones wasn't conducted till the second examination of his tomb and the items in it on May the 7th in 1957. 
Each bone was carefully measured, and with that information, scientists were able to reconstruct a skeleton, see how it was proportioned, and because the skull was in fantastic condition, they could get an accurate image of what St. Nicholas looked like. It's... a bit different from what we'd normally imagine Santa looking like. For several years, there was a big mystery when the bones that were found to belong to St. Nicholas were also found in Myra. Luigi Martino was again asked to examine the bones in 1992. They were left behind for the same reason that all the bones in Bari, except the skull, were broken. The merchants that moved the body did so in a rush and couldn't properly care for the 700-year-old bones. The huge dispute between Venice and Bari as to whom was the real beholder of St. Nicholas's remains was settled when Dr. Martino officially concluded that they were both his resting place. December the 6th became his feast day and is still celebrated today, but mostly in European countries. The most drawing appeal of this day is actually the day before it, on the 5th, the children receive gifts. Just like Europeans celebrate different Christmas-like holidays, their Santas differ from the American idea of Santa. Of course, they were much closer to the main source of the age-old fable, and just like any other foreign originating tales, our copies of the primary sources still have possible margin of error because we don't speak Turkish. Not only that, but the translations and interpretations from language to language has caused there to be several names for the saint and his mystical legacy. In the U.S., we know him as Santa, Santa Claus, Saint Nick, and Kris Kringle. Over in the U.K., they address him as Father Christmas, and over in the Netherlands, Saint Nicholas, commonly known as Citroclas. The truly sinister part, though, is found in Austria. In their country, the standing fable includes an evil counterpart that follows around Vinachman. While he is giving gifts to the good boys and girls that deserve kindness, Krampus, his terrifying partner, beats the naughty kids with birch sticks and then drags them to the underworld. That's... One way to keep your kids well-behaved throughout the year. We owe many of modern-day traditions to St. Nick. What's a decoration but also a literal sock of gifts? Stockings. These are the variations in the story of the three daughters. Some tellings have St. Nick coming down the chimney and depositing the gold in the girl's stockings that were drying over the fireplace. And while it would be a wonderful tradition to receive a ball of gold, many people put oranges in their kids' stockings because they look roughly the same. Stockings have been made a staple of the holiday for as long as we can remember, but back in the mid-1800s edition of a New York Times, they documented that Christmas trees had almost completely replaced stockings. Most kids find out that their parents are responsible for the orange in their stockings when they're a bit older, but the point is they know Santa, the gift giver, not Saint Nick, the saint that sought to spread goodness in honor of God. It's interesting how the figure they're taught now differs not only from the saint, but also from the figure of Santa Claus that had originally spawned from early America. Like I mentioned before, the Europeans brought the St. Nicholas tradition over the Atlantic Ocean with them, and when they came to America was when the fictional character probably came to be. More specifically, the 1773 gathering of Dutch settlers are to thank. They were gathering in honor of St. Nicholas's death on his feast day, and other settlers took notice. The tradition then spread, and sources point to this event as to why we hire large men to dress up and sit in our malls, take pictures with our children, and gather their wish list. Though shopping exclusively for Christmas wasn't advertised until 1820. So really, what tradition do we all care about? Not gift-giving, but gift-receiving. Gift-receiving is again thanks to St. Nicholas's gold-giving expedition. People wanted to spread happiness and goodness like he did and began secretly giving gifts anonymously as well. One of the biggest contributors to the capitalization of Santa is Coca-Cola. The polar bear is the generation of Santa on their bottles. They've become the trademarks that show up in our lives more than we think. Back in the 1920s, Coke used their first picture of Santa. This image, though, started gaining a lot of speed in 1934 to 1964, and the artist at the time was a man named Hayden Sunbloom. In 1931, an advertising company in Coke set out to revolutionize Santa. They pulled inspiration from the 1822 poem, A Visit from St. Nick, by Clement Clark Moore. Coke reports getting letters from fans whenever a design would change. Many fans mailed in when Santa's belt was backwards, probably because the artist had to use himself as a model and had to look into a mirror after his original model had died. But really, what hit the advertising market was Coke's first commercial that it aired on Thanksgiving Day in 1950. So all in all, St. Nicholas, in all of his holiness and goodness, left behind an image of Christmas. We should do good deeds in the name of the Lord, spread our wealth, and above all, be humble and modest in the act. His legacy of gift-giving took an unexpected turn. It devolved to what we know today as Santa Claus and other traditions of Christmas. Santa gives us gifts, we get stockings full of goodies, and Coke bottles, as well as pretty much everything else now, comes out with a new holiday theme label whenever that time of the year rolls around. St. Nicholas was a leader able to mesmerize countries and single fathers with his modesty and giving and love of God. But has all his life's work been in vain, with the gift-revolving image of Christmas now? Well, that's up to you. Has it?